Though the events preceding Princess Diana's untimely demise at 36 have been scrutinized and dissected repeatedly over the past 20 years, none have matched the thoroughness of this account. Here, we unveil the precise moments down to the very second of that tragic night and explore the hidden corners that remain uncharted. Furthermore, we will also answer all suspicions about a harmful motive from the royal family that has been rumored for a long time. This is a revelation you won't want to miss. On Saturday, 30th of August, 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, embarked on a journey that would ultimately lead to her tragic end. She departed from Olbia Airport in Sardinia on a private jet, accompanied by Egyptian film producer Dodi Fayed, the son of businessman Mohamed Al-Fayed. The couple arrived at Le Bourget Airport in Paris, having spent the previous nine days together aboard Mohamed's luxurious yacht, Jonacal, cruising the idyllic French and Italian Riviera. Their time on the yacht was a brief respite from public scrutiny, allowing them to enjoy each other's company in relative peace before returning to the bustling city of Paris. Their itinerary included an overnight stay in Paris, en route to London. Mohamed Al-Fayed owned the prestigious Hotel Ritz Paris and resided in a nearby apartment on Rue Arsène Ousset, conveniently located just off the famed Avenue des Champs-Élysées. The plan for the evening was to stay at the Ritz before moving to Mohamed's apartment. However, the ever-present paparazzi threatened to disrupt their plans. To outwit the photographers, Henri Paul, the deputy head of security at the Ritz, was tasked with driving the couple in a hired black 1994 armored Mercedes-Benz S280 saloon, part of the W140 S-Class series. To mislead the paparazzi, a decoy vehicle exited the Ritz from the main entrance on Place Vendôme, drawing a swarm of photographers away from the actual departure point. Diana and Dodie then quietly slipped out of the hotel's rear entrance on Rue Cambon at approximately ZYZO 20 on 31st August, Sest, 2220 on 30th August, UTC. Their destination was Mohammed's apartment on Rue Arsène Ousset. The decision to leave from the rear entrance was a strategic move to evade the nearly 30 photographers waiting in front of the hotel, eager to capture any glimpse of the couple. In the car with Diana and Dodie were Trevor Reese Jones, a member of the Fayed family's personal protection team, who occupied the front passenger seat, and Henry Paul at the wheel. Notably, none of the occupants were wearing seat belts. As they left Rue Cambon and navigated across the Place de la Concorde, the journey initially seemed smooth. They continued along Cours la Reine and Cours Albert Ferrer, which run parallel to the right bank of the River Seine, heading towards the Place de l'Alma underpass. The serene setting of Paris at night contrasted sharply with the chaos that would soon ensue. The paparazzi, undeterred by the decoy, quickly picked up the trail of the Mercedes. The pursuit intensified as the car approached the Place de l'Alma underpass, a tunnel notorious for its sharp curves and high-speed traffic. In the frenzy to escape the relentless photographers, the car entered the tunnel at high speed, setting the stage for the devastating crash that would claim the lives of Diana, Dodie, and Henry Paul and leave Trevor Reese Jones with serious injuries. At 0023 on the 31st of August 1997, tragedy struck as Henri Paul, the driver of the Mercedes-Benz S280 carrying Diana, Princess of Wales, and her companions, lost control of the vehicle at the entrance to the Pont de l'Alma underpass in Paris. The high-speed chase by the paparazzi had turned deadly. Witnesses later recounted that the Mercedes had been pursued aggressively by photographers on motorcycles who swarmed the vehicle as it approached the tunnel entrance, adding to the pressure and chaos of the moment. As Paul tried to navigate the vehicle through the tunnel, the car reportedly collided with a white Fiat. This collision caused the Mercedes to swerve dramatically to the left side of the two-lane carriageway. In a split second, the car crashed head-on into the 13th pillar that supported the tunnel's roof. 
The force of the impact was catastrophic, as the vehicle was traveling at an estimated speed of 105 km h, 65 m p h, more than twice the legal speed limit of 50 km h, 31 m p h, for the tunnel. The lack of a guard rail exacerbated the severity of the crash, as there was nothing to cushion the impact against the solid concrete pillar. Solid con the immediate aftermath of the crash was chaotic and horrifying. The Mercedes spun violently upon impact, its rear end smashing into the stone wall of the tunnel before finally coming to a stop. The front half of the car bore the brunt of the collision, sustaining substantial damage. The vehicle was mangled almost beyond recognition, a crumpled mass of metal and shattered glass. Inside, the occupants were critically injured, their bodies subjected to the brutal forces of the high-speed crash. Witnesses who arrived on the scene shortly after the crash described a scene of devastation. Smoke emanated from the wreckage, a grim testament to the violent nature of the collision. The severity of the impact was immediately apparent, and the urgency of the situation was clear. However, the response was complicated by the presence of the very paparazzi who had been pursuing the car. Instead of offering assistance, some of these photographers continued to take pictures of the crash site, an act that would later draw widespread condemnation. The photographers, who had been following the Mercedes at a slower speed and were some distance behind, arrived at the crash scene moments later. The scene they encountered was both shocking and distressing. While the primary concern should have been the well-being of the crash victims, the actions of the photographers were divided. Some of them, recognizing the gravity of the situation, rushed to the mangled vehicle to try to offer assistance. They attempted to open the doors and provide help to Diana, Dodi Fayed, Henri Paul, and Trevor Reese Jones. However, others chose to continue taking pictures, capturing the harrowing aftermath of the crash. Witnesses at the scene were horrified by the behavior of these photographers who prioritized their professional interests over the urgent need to help the victims. The distress and outrage of the witnesses were palpable, leading to a confrontation. According to reports, one photographer was beaten by onlookers appalled by the scene and the actions of the paparazzi. The police arrived at the crash site approximately 10 minutes after the accident, at around 0030. Their arrival brought some semblance of order to the chaotic scene. They immediately began to assess the situation and take control of the area. The presence of the police was crucial in managing the crowd and securing the crash site. Within five minutes of the police arrival, an ambulance arrived on the scene, as reported by witnesses. The medical personnel quickly began providing emergency care to the victims. The actions of the police were decisive. Five of the photographers were arrested on the spot, reflecting the immediate need to address the disruptive and intrusive behavior of the paparazzi. In the following hours, two more photographers were detained, bringing the total number of detained individuals to seven. The police also confiscated around 20 rolls of film directly from the photographers, aiming to secure the evidence and prevent the spread of invasive images that could further exploit the victim's privacy. Additionally, the vehicles of the photographers were impounded, underscoring the seriousness with which the authorities were treating the incident. Firefighters also arrived at the scene to assist in the rescue efforts, their expertise was critical in carefully extricating the victims from the wreckage of the severely damaged Mercedes. The firefighters worked alongside the medical team to ensure that the victims were removed from the vehicle as safely and quickly as possible. Trevor Reese Jones, the bodyguard and front passenger in the ill-fated Mercedes-Benz S280, sustained multiple serious facial injuries and a head contusion during the crash, yet he remained conscious. The front airbags had functioned as intended, which likely contributed to his survival. Reports suggest that Reese Jones was the only occupant wearing a seatbelt at the time of the crash, which further aided in mitigating the extent of his injuries. Princess Diana, seated in the right rear passenger seat, suffered critical injuries but was also conscious following the collision. The impact predominantly affected the right side of her body, indicating that she might have been sitting sideways at the time of the crash. Her injuries were severe, 
fractured ribs and arm, a dislocated right collarbone, and significant swelling and bruising to her brain. Despite her grievous condition, she was reported to murmur repeatedly, Oh my God! And later, after the police pushed away photographers and other would-be helpers, she was heard to say, Leave me alone. Leave me alone. An off-duty physician, Dr. Frederick Maillier, chanced upon the crash scene and became the first to provide medical assistance to Diana. According to a Channel 4 documentary titled Diana, the Witnesses in the Tunnel, Dr. Maillier reported that Diana had no visible injuries but was in a state of shock. She was extremely disturbed, and at one point, she even removed an intravenous drip while shouting incoherently. Diana's condition deteriorated rapidly. At approximately 01 hours, she was sedated and extricated from the car. During this process, she went into cardiac arrest, but her heart began beating again following external cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. At 0118, Diana was moved to an ambulance. The vehicle left the crash scene at 0141 and arrived at the Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital at 0206. Dodi Fayed, who was seated in the left rear passenger seat, was pronounced dead shortly after the collision. Henry Paul, the driver of the Mercedes-Benz S280, was also declared dead upon removal from the wreckage. Both bodies were immediately transported to the Institut Medico Legal, IML, the Paris mortuary, for further examination. Subsequent investigations revealed that Henri Paul had a blood alcohol level of 180 milligrams per 100 milliliters of blood, which was nearly four times the legal limit in France. This significant level of intoxication impaired his ability to drive safely and was a critical factor in the fatal crash. Princess Diana, seated in the right rear passenger seat, suffered extensive and catastrophic injuries. The force of the impact was so severe that her heart had been displaced to the right side of her chest, resulting in a tear of the upper left pulmonary vein and the pericardium. Despite the best efforts of the medical team, including internal cardiac massage, resuscitation attempts were ultimately unsuccessful. Diana succumbed to her injuries and was pronounced dead at the hospital at Oford Bau. Dr. Bruno Ryu, an anesthetist involved in the emergency response, announced her death during a news conference held at 06 away. The news of Diana's death sent shockwaves around the globe. French Prime Minister Lionel Jospin and Interior Minister Jean-Pierre Chevènement visited the Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital that morning to pay their respects and to express their condolences. Later that day, around 17 now, Diana's former husband, Prince Charles, and her two older sisters, Lady Sarah McCorkwadale and Lady Jane Fellows, arrived in Paris. They visited the hospital along with French President Jacques Chirac, who joined them in thanking the doctors and medical staff for their efforts to save Diana's life. The somber procession continued as Prince Charles accompanied Diana's body back to the United Kingdom later that same day. They departed from Velizy, Villa Coublet Air Base, and landed at RAF Northolt. Upon arrival, a bearer party from the Queen's Color Squadron respectfully transferred her coffin to a hearse. Draped with the royal standard adorned with an ermine border, Diana's coffin was then taken to the Hammersmith and Fulham Mortuary in London for a post-mortem examination. The post-mortem examination was a necessary but solemn step in the aftermath of the tragedy. It aimed to provide a detailed understanding of the injuries that led to Diana's untimely death. This examination was critical for both legal and medical purposes, ensuring that all aspects of the incident were thoroughly documented and understood. Early media reports claimed that the car had collided with the pillar at a speed of 190 km h 120 mm height, citing that the speedometer's needle was jammed at that position upon impact. However, subsequent investigations corrected this information, revealing that the Mercedes-Benz S280 was traveling at a speed between 95, 110 km h 59, 68 mph at the time of collision, still significantly over the 50 km h 31 Bipar Mach 
speed limit of the tunnel. In 1999, a comprehensive French investigation provided further insights into the crash. It concluded that the Mercedes had indeed come into contact with a white Fiat Uno inside the tunnel, which likely contributed to the accident. Despite extensive efforts, the driver of the Fiat was never conclusively identified. There was speculation around Le Van Thon, who was questioned by French detectives shortly after the crash in 1997. Although Thon was ruled out as a suspect by the authorities at the time, inconsistencies in his account of the events raised suspicions. Friends and family members of Thon also pointed out discrepancies, yet he has consistently refused to participate in interviews or further inquiries from investigators. The specific Fiat Uno involved was never identified, adding a layer of mystery to the tragic event. British Foreign Secretary Robin Cook commented on the potential involvement of the paparazzi, suggesting that if their relentless pursuit had contributed to the crash, it would be doubly tragic. Diana's younger brother, Earl Spencer, openly blamed the tabloid media for her death, highlighting the intense and often invasive scrutiny Diana faced from the press. The 18-month French judicial investigation concluded in 1999 determined that the primary cause of the crash was the loss of control by Henri Paul, the driver of the Mercedes. The investigation revealed that Paul was driving at high speed while intoxicated, with a blood alcohol level nearly four times the legal limit in France. This impairment, combined with the high speed, led to the fatal crash. Despite the conclusions of the investigation, no charges were brought against the paparazzi who had been following Diana's car. This outcome fueled public debate about the role of the media in the tragic event and the ethical boundaries of press conduct. The relentless pursuit by photographers, driven by the lucrative market for images of the princess, was widely condemned. Many believed that the aggressive tactics used by the paparazzi created an environment of constant pressure and fear for Diana, ultimately contributing to the circumstances of her death. Following the tragic death of Princess Diana, the public was invited to express their grief and condolences through various avenues. St. James's Palace opened a book of condolence where people could leave messages for Diana. Similarly, the British Embassy in the United States established a condolence book, allowing Americans to join in mourning the loss of the beloved princess. In a poignant gesture of mourning, Mohammed Al-Fayed, owner of the Harrods department store, turned off all 11,000 light bulbs at the iconic establishment. The lights remained off until after Diana's funeral, serving as a visual tribute to her memory. Throughout the night, as thousands of mourners queued along the mall to pay their respects, members of the Women's Royal Voluntary Service and the Salvation Army provided support and comfort. The outpouring of grief was immense, with more than one million bouquets left at Kensington Palace, Diana's London residence. The volume of flowers was so overwhelming that at her family's estate in Althorpe, the public was asked to cease bringing floral tributes as the influx of visitors and flowers began to pose a threat to public safety due to congested roads. By September 10th, the sea of flowers outside Kensington Gardens had reached a depth of 5 feet, 1.5 meters, in some areas, with the bottom layer starting to compost. Despite the overwhelming number of people, the atmosphere remained quiet and respectful. Mourners patiently queued to sign the condolence book and leave their gifts. The scene was a testament to the deep affection and sorrow felt by people from all walks of life. Among the tributes left were fresh flowers, teddy bears, and bottles of champagne. These items were later collected and distributed to the sick, elderly, and children, extending Diana's legacy of compassion and care. Personal messages, cards, and poems left by the public were meticulously gathered and given to Diana's family, offering them comfort and a tangible connection to the widespread mourning. In the immediate aftermath of Princess Diana's tragic death, 
there was significant uncertainty regarding the nature of her funeral. Having lost her title of Her Royal Highness, following her divorce from Prince Charles in 1996, it was initially unclear if she would receive a ceremonial funeral. However, the unprecedented public outpouring of grief necessitated a reconsideration of her funeral arrangements. Diana's death was met with extraordinary public expressions of sorrow. People from around the world expressed their grief through numerous tributes, including flowers, personal messages, and vigils. The intensity of the public's reaction underscored the profound impact Diana had on people's lives and solidified the decision to hold a funeral befitting her status as the People's Princess. On 6 September 1997, Diana's funeral took place at Westminster Abbey. The event drew an estimated three million mourners and onlookers to the streets of London. Outside the Abbey and in Hyde Park, crowds gathered to watch and listen to the proceedings on large outdoor screens and speakers. The atmosphere was one of deep mourning and reflection as people from all walks of life came together to honor Diana's memory. Diana's memory. The funeral was attended by representatives of the numerous charities Diana had supported throughout her life. This included a wide array of dignitaries and celebrities, highlighting the breadth of her influence. Among the notable attendees were U.S. First Lady Hillary Clinton and French First Lady Bernadette Chirac. The presence of Italian tenor Luciano Pavarotti and close friends of Diana, such as George Michael and Elton John, added a personal touch to the solemn occasion. Elton John performed a poignant and reworked version of his song Candle in the Wind, dedicated to Diana, and known as Goodbye England's Rose or Candle in the Wind 1997. This tribute became an enduring symbol of Diana's legacy and resonated deeply with the public. The single went on to become the best-selling single since the inception of the UK and US singles charts in the 1950s, with total sales exceeding 33 million units. One of the most memorable moments of the funeral was the speech delivered by Diana's brother, Earl Spencer. In his eulogy, he strongly criticized the press for their invasive and relentless pursuit of Diana, which many believed had contributed to her untimely death. He also indirectly criticized the royal family for their treatment of Diana. His candid and heartfelt words resonated with the public and broke with traditional protocol when the guests applauded his speech, a rare occurrence at such a somber event. The funeral of Princess Diana was watched by an estimated 31.5 million viewers in Britain alone. The global audience for the ceremony was estimated to be around 2.5 billion people, making it one of the most watched events in television history. The ceremony was broadcast in 44 languages, ensuring that people worldwide could partake in the collective mourning. After the conclusion of the ceremony at Westminster Abbey, Princess Diana's coffin was transported to her family's estate, Althorpe, in a Daimler hearse. The journey was marked by a poignant display of public mourning. As the funeral procession made its way to Althorpe, mourners lined the streets, casting flowers in tribute to Diana. This spontaneous gesture of respect and sorrow continued for almost the entire length of the route. The sight of vehicles stopping on the opposite carriageway of the M1 motorway as the hearse passed underscored the profound impact Diana had on the public. Diana's final resting place was chosen to be a serene island in the middle of a lake known as the Oval, located within the Pleasure Garden at Althorpe. The burial was a private ceremony, attended only by her immediate family and close friends. This secluded and tranquil setting provided a fitting and peaceful place for Diana to be laid to rest, away from the public eye and media attention that had surrounded her life. The coffin, lined with lead as per British royal tradition, weighed a quarter of a ton, approximately 250 kilograms or 550 pounds. This tradition is intended to preserve the body, reflecting the long-standing customs associated with royal burials. Diana was dressed in a black Catherine Walker dress and black tights, symbolizing her elegance and grace. In her hands, she held a rosary, 
a deeply personal and significant item that had been gifted to her by Mother Teresa of Calcutta. The rosary's presence in the coffin highlighted the bond between Diana and Mother Teresa, who had passed away just a day before Diana's funeral. This connection between two prominent humanitarian figures added a layer of poignancy to the burial. To honor Diana's memory and allow the public to connect with her legacy, a visitor's center was established at Althorpe. Open during the summer months, the center features an exhibition dedicated to Diana's life and her charitable work. Visitors can also take a walk around the lake, reflecting on Diana's impact while surrounded by the natural beauty of the estate. The decision to donate all profits from the Visitor's Center to the Diana, Princess of Wales Memorial Fund, ensured that her charitable efforts continued to benefit those in need. In the wake of Princess Diana's tragic death, Queen Elizabeth II publicly expressed her deep dismay and sorrow. The impact of Diana's passing was felt profoundly within the royal family, and the response was carefully managed to reflect both personal grief and public expectations. Following the announcement of Diana's death, then Prince Charles took the somber task of informing his sons, Princes William and Harry. In a move that underscored the gravity of the situation, Charles woke his sons before dawn to share the devastating news. This early morning revelation was a moment of intense personal and familial grief, marking the beginning of a period of mourning for the royal family. In an immediate response to Diana's death, the royal family's official website was temporarily taken offline. In its place, a black background was displayed, featuring a poignant image of Diana, along with her name and the dates of her birth and death. This stark and respectful gesture reflected the gravity of the loss and provided the public with a means to honor her memory. An online book of condolence was also set up on the website, allowing people from around the world to post their personal tributes and messages of sympathy. On the Sunday morning following Diana's death, members of the royal family attended church services at Craithy Kirk, near Balmoral Castle. Queen Elizabeth II, Prince Charles, and the young princes William and Harry were seen wearing black, a traditional symbol of mourning. This public appearance was significant, as it demonstrated the family's respect for Diana and their shared sorrow. The visual representation of their mourning was an important aspect of public and media perception during this period. In a subsequent statement, the royal family expressed their gratitude for the overwhelming public support they had received. The statement conveyed that Charles, William, and Harry were taking strength from the outpouring of condolences and were deeply touched by the public's expressions of sympathy. The acknowledgement of this support was crucial in bridging the gap between the royal family and the grieving public. Princes Andrew and Edward took proactive steps to gauge the public mood and offer their own condolences. Edward, in particular, visited St. James's Palace to sign the Book of Condolences, a gesture that reflected the royal family's ongoing engagement with the public's mourning. Meanwhile, Princes Andrew and Edward met with mourners outside Kensington Palace in an effort to connect with the public directly and understand the mood of the nation. As they traveled from Crathy Kirk to Balmoral, Queen Elizabeth II, Prince Philip, Prince Charles, and the young princes made a deliberate stop to view the floral tributes and messages left by the public. This visit to the Sea of Flowers and personal notes left outside Diana's former residence was a significant moment of reflection. It allowed the royal family to witness firsthand the depth of public grief and the scale of the outpouring of love and respect for Diana. On Friday, 5th September 1997, Prince Charles and his sons, Princes William and Harry, returned to London from Balmoral. Their return marked a significant moment as they made an unannounced visit to Kensington Palace, where a sea of floral tributes had been left by mourners in memory of Diana. This private visit allowed them to see firsthand the immense outpouring of public grief and respect for Diana. Meanwhile, Queen Elizabeth II, who had been at Balmoral with Prince Philip, the Queen Mother, and Princess Margaret, also returned to London.
Her return was accompanied by significant media attention and public scrutiny. In response to the overwhelming public grief and criticism of the royal family's initial response, the Queen agreed to a televised broadcast. This decision was a departure from royal protocol and was aimed at addressing the nation's grief directly. During her time in London, the Queen viewed the floral tributes placed outside Buckingham Palace. This visit was a gesture of solidarity with the public and an acknowledgement of the widespread mourning. She also visited the Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace, where Diana's body was being kept prior to the funeral. At the Chapel Royal, the Queen and other members of the royal family met with the crowds waiting to sign the Books of Condolence. This act of engagement was intended to offer support and comfort to those who had come to pay their respects. Diana's brother, Earl Spencer, and her former sister-in-law, Sarah, Duchess of York, also visited St. James's Palace during this period. Their presence was part of the broader response to the public's mourning and highlighted the familial connections that were being honored alongside the national grief. Despite these efforts, the royal family faced considerable criticism for what was perceived as a rigid adherence to protocol. The public and media criticism focused on the perception that the royal family's actions were insufficiently empathetic. The Queen's initial refusal to fly the royal standard at half-mast over Buckingham Palace was particularly contentious. The royal standard, which is the sovereign's personal flag, is traditionally never flown at half-mast. This practice is based on the principle that the monarchy is a continuous institution and that there is no interregnum between the death of one monarch and the accession of another. The controversy surrounding the royal standard reflected broader frustrations with the perceived detachment of the royal family. The palace's stance on the flag was seen by some as an unwillingness to adapt to the unprecedented situation of Diana's death. The decision not to lower the royal standard was interpreted by many as a lack of respect for Diana's memory and a failure to acknowledge the depth of public sorrow. In response to the mounting criticism and public outcry, a compromise was reached. On the day of Diana's funeral, the Union flag was flown at half-mast over Buckingham Palace as the Queen departed for Westminster Abbey. This adjustment marked a significant shift in royal protocol and set a new precedent for future events. Buckingham Palace has since adopted this practice, allowing the Union flag to be flown at half-mast when the monarch is not in residence, reflecting a more flexible approach to royal traditions in response to public sentiment. One notable rift reported in the media was between Prince Charles and Sir Robert Fellows, the Queen's private secretary, and Diana's brother-in-law. This disagreement centered on whether Diana's funeral should be public or private. Prince Charles reportedly advocated for a public ceremony, reflecting the deep connection Diana had with the public and the widespread desire to honor her openly. In contrast, Fellows supported a more private affair aligned with the Queen's preference, which would offer the royal family a measure of personal privacy during the mourning period. Despite these reports, Buckingham Palace later issued a statement denying any such rift, aiming to quell speculation and emphasize the unified approach of the royal family in managing the funeral arrangements. Another contentious issue was the debate over whether Diana's HRH, her royal highness style, should be restored posthumously. Diana had lost this title following her divorce from Prince Charles in 1996. Discussions were held among the Spencer family and the British royal family about whether reinstating the HRH title would be appropriate. Ultimately, Diana's family decided against it, believing it would contradict her wishes. No formal offer was made to restore the title, maintaining the decision that Diana's status should remain as it was at the time of her death. The funeral arrangements also sparked internal debate about the involvement of Diana's sons, Princes William and Harry. The funeral committee at Buckingham Palace suggested that the young princes have a more prominent role in the ceremony, including walking in the funeral cortege. This proposal faced opposition from Prince Philip, who expressed concerns about the emotional impact on the boys, he reportedly stated, They've just lost their mother. 
You're talking about them as if they are commodities. This comment highlighted the sensitivity and respect required in handling the prince's roles during the funeral. Prince Harry later shared that his mother's death caused him profound grief and depression. In interviews and public statements, he revealed that what he experienced after Diana's death was akin to post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. At the time of her death, Harry was only 12 years old, and his older brother William was 15. The intense media scrutiny and the loss of their mother at such a young age left a lasting impact on both princes. Following Diana's death, the princes received locks of their mother's hair from their aunt, Lady Sarah McCorquadale, upon her return from Paris. This personal memento was a poignant reminder of their mother and provided a small comfort amidst their grief. In subsequent years, both William and Harry defended their father, Prince Charles, and their grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II, against criticism of their actions following Diana's death. Harry, reflecting on his father's role, acknowledged that Prince Charles did his best to support and protect his sons. He appreciated his father's efforts to shield them from the media frenzy and ensure their well-being. William also spoke in defense of his grandmother, explaining that her actions were motivated by a desire to protect her grandsons. He revealed that the Queen had deliberately removed newspapers and media coverage from their home to shield them from the intense scrutiny and distressing reports. Lady Sarah McCorquadale also defended the Queen's decision to maintain a low profile during the immediate aftermath of Diana's death. She affirmed that the Queen's approach was appropriate, reflecting the difficult balance between public expectations and personal mourning. British Prime Minister Tony Blair was one of the first to publicly express the depth of his sorrow, stating that he was utterly devastated by the death of the princess. Blair's statement captured the national mood, as Diana's death marked a significant moment of grief and reflection for many Britons. U.S. President Bill Clinton and First Lady Hillary Clinton also conveyed their profound sadness upon hearing the news. Their sentiments echoed the global mourning and recognized Diana's influence beyond the United Kingdom. Clinton's statement highlighted the international resonance of Diana's humanitarian efforts and the personal impact of her passing. Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, remarked on the loss of a consistent and committed voice for the improvement of the lives of suffering children worldwide. Annan's comment underscored Diana's significant contributions to global humanitarian causes, particularly her advocacy for children in need. German Chancellor Helmut Kohl expressed his condolences through a telegram, noting that Diana had fallen victim to the increasingly brutal and unscrupulous competition on the part of some of the media. Kohl's statement reflected the growing concern about the media's role in Diana's life and death, highlighting the intense scrutiny and invasive coverage that had characterized her final years. In Australia, Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher condemned the paparazzi for their excessive coverage of Diana. Fisher's remarks were part of a broader criticism of media practices, acknowledging the role of press intrusion in Diana's tragic end. Russian President Boris Yeltsin praised Diana's extensive charitable work, stating, All know of Princess Diana's big contribution to charitable work, and not only in Great Britain. Yeltsin's tribute emphasized Diana's global charitable influence and her dedication to various causes. Messages of condolence came from leaders worldwide, including Australian Prime Minister John Howard, South African President Nelson Mandela, Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, New Zealand Prime Minister Jim Bolger, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Each leader expressed their sympathy and recognized Diana's impact, reflecting the international scope of her influence. In addition to individual messages, parliamentary bodies also paid tribute. The Australian House of Representatives and the New Zealand House of Representatives both passed motions of condolence, formalizing their respects in the legislative context. In Canada, both the federal government and individual provinces set up online and in-person books of condolences. 
Memorial services were held across the country, demonstrating the widespread public grief and admiration for Diana's humanitarian efforts. Diana's legacy in the realm of humanitarian work was particularly notable in the context of her campaign to ban landmines. Delegates at an international conference in Oslo, where discussions about banning landmines were held, paid their respects to Diana. Her work in this area was influential, and the Ottawa Treaty, which established an international ban on anti-personnel landmines, was adopted in Oslo and signed by 122 states in December 1997. Diana's advocacy was widely recognized as a driving force behind the treaty, illustrating the significant impact of her activism. What do you think about Princess Diana's death? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.